views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Welcome to Bronx Talk. Food insecurity is one of the Bronx's most overlooked epidemics in a borough that unfortunately is filled with them. Tonight we have three experts who will take us through the myriad of issues that have led to this devastating problem. We'll show how it's being addressed and how we might once and for all get it under control. First I want to show you some numbers that are uh, pretty revealing. And uh, so uh, take a look at this chart. Um, this, if you look at the um, top right corner, the, you can see the Bronx on the top line. Uh, the percentage change from 2019 to 2021 of food insecurity in the Bronx went up 36%. And moving to the left a little bit, you see 320,000 people, this is estimated for last year, uh, are uh, suffering from food insecurity. And they just keep moving from uh, right to left. 22.3% uh, was the food insecurity rate that were projections as of March 2021. And uh, the real key is way back in 2019, before the pandemic, it was 16.4%. But that was no picnic either, because that was still, if you go down the list, the, the highest rate in uh, the city of New York. So there is no doubt that this is a, a very, very serious problem. And uh, we're going to turn the program over to our guests and uh, see what uh, they think about it. So uh, now let's uh, meet the guest, the assembly member from the 79th AD, which includes the uh, Bronx neighborhoods of Concourse Village, Morrisania, Melrose, Belmont, Claremont, and East Tremont. It is assembly member Chantel Jackson. Assembly member, thanks for joining us. Always a pleasure to be here with you, Gary. Thank you for having me. Uh, also the Director of Policy and Government Relations for City Harvest. It is Jerome Nathaniel. Sir, nice to have you with us. Thanks so much for having me. And for this conversation. the uh, co-organizer of Friendly Fridge uh, BX is uh, Sarah Allen. Ms. Allen, nice to have you with us. Thank you for having me. Um, let's start with the Assembly Member. Assembly Member, um, what, talk about your district. I mean, you've got a, a, some very crowded, busy neighborhoods, um, but you are spending a lot of time and energy trying to simply get them fed. It is uh, distressing. Tell me all about it. Yeah, Gary, the numbers that you read are disheartening, but this is our reality. Uh, when the pandemic started, I was working with World Central Kitchen and we delivered over a million meals here in the Bronx. And through time, I've been working with Common Pantry and Fresh Direct to just get the simple things. And these are not people who are like maybe uh, homeless or, you know, are without a home. These are these are working people who still cannot afford food and they are getting on our pantry lines. They're extremely long at this point uh, and it's not slowing up. Even with people going back to work, there's still a need and there's still food insecurity here in the South Bronx. I guess uh, the uh, among the many distressing things that we just heard from you, you say they're going back to work, but yet they still are, apparently are not making enough money to feed their families. Um, you know, this, and, and we're going to talk with Mr. Nathaniel in a moment about, you know, the connection between, you know, the economy and, and uh, this issue of food insecurity. Um, that, that, you know, it's like it doesn't, doesn't work. It doesn't go together. Um, it, what kind of jobs do people have that are not paying them well enough to simply do, you know, the fundamental right that we all have is to have enough to eat. Listen, not even our uh, most educated, most, uh, you know, licensed uh, employees, employers um, are not making enough. So we have nurses who are ha who are having a hard time. We have social workers like myself, uh, you know, social workers are having a hard time. So it's not even the fact of like 
low scale or low paying jobs um, or low skill, as, as, as some people may say. It's not that. It's, it's, it's all of us. We're all feeling the, the effect of inflation, of things, of prices going up and our pay just not equaling that. Is there something that can be done through the state? I mean, is it a matter of, well, let's budget more, let's uh, maybe tax breaks for groceries or, you know, do something like that? Or is there legislation that can help? I mean, one of the things we try to do is envision a better world and a better Bronx. Um, what do we need to do? And can the state do something? Yeah, I mean, there's always monies that we can put towards uh, the things that we need. It's just a matter of whose interest uh, who, who's interested in those things. Um, I'm, I'm a social worker, so I care more about the people. And as far as legislation is concerned, uh, Jamal Bailey and I have a bill for agriculture here in the Bronx so people can grow their own food. So it's not that um, grow their own food, but also sell their sell what they grow. And so we're trying to figure out how to get that done here, right here in the South Bronx. One of the things that I have talked about on my program and, and privately is the, the universal that if you go to any neighborhood now in the Bronx and you say, hey, we want to put up a farmer's market, people will say, yes, that's good. We like, you know, it's like it, there's nobody who will say, no, we don't want farmer's markets. And, uh, you know, I've been to a number of them. And that's one way that we're going to address this by getting local economies around the notion of food as opposed to having it come from somewhere else. Do I, do I have that right? Absolutely. Right. And the farmer's markets, we love them. We just need them to operate when people are available to uh, be out there and utilize them. And we need to give away those, uh, I forget what they call them, but like the bucks where uh, if you, you know, I believe the city council got them and the borough president have them as well. They're giving it to the people so that you can use those those farmers markets bucks to go and purchase fresh food. I believe if you uh, bring in composting, you can get a, a coupon for a couple of dollars, which is, you know, recycling, win, win, win all over uh, the city. Um, Assembly member, thank you very much. Let's talk to uh, Mr. Nathaniel. Um, you guys put out, now I've got it here, the, um, this uh, overlooked and undercounted uh, study uh, that you put out. So um, talk to me, Mr. Nathaniel, about what the study was about and you know, wh why you think and why the people at City Harvest think this is an approach that can help us understand how to address this issue. Mm -hmm. Yes, the, the report is very important to help us recognize the scale of need in New York City. So it tells us that there's um, at least 2.4 million working age New Yorkers that don't have enough income to afford food with housing, transportation, and childcare. So understanding the need is critical for us to understand the response that's required. Uh, one of the things that, and you heard the assembly member talk about it, and, and we're going to lead into you, uh, is to talk about the relationship between the economy and, and your report addresses it as well, but between the economy and food insecurity. Let's talk about some of these numbers. You, you put out a map that I thought was fascinating. Talk to me about uh, the income inadequacy rates and where the Bronx falls in this. Um, yeah, so uh, kind of going back to that point about the poverty rate, the poverty rate says that if a single parent with a one child in the Bronx is making more than $18,000, they're not considered poor. They may not be eligible for government benefit programs. But when we look at the self-sufficiency rate, it says that a family in the Bronx, a single parent with one child, we need to make at least $66,000 to be able to support their family. So that tells us the scale of the need that we might be missing. And when we look at how the Bronx disproportionately faces those challenges, um, over 60% of uh, Bronx residents are considered to be below the self-sufficiency standards. So that's a huge number and, and a huge scale of a response that's required. And, and you know, I, I can't help but with um, annoyance, let's put it that way, uh, look at a map like that and say, well, wait a minute, 69% of the people in the Bronx have, uh, you know, below the income uh, adequacy rate. Uh, that uh, that that is disturbing. I believe you told me that the threshold was seventy thousand dollars, right? Um, so, just talk to me a little bit about that and why the borough of the Bronx, and you look at Queens at forty-five, Brooklyn at fifty-five, Staten Island at thirty-four. This is not just a little bit larger. This is epidemic, as I said at the top of the show. 
Yeah, unfortunately, it's an overlap with all the other needs that we're seeing that unfortunately disproportionately impacts um, uh, Black and Latinx communities. The same communities that have the highest food and security rates, highest unemployment rates, and the highest COVID-19 rates are the same communities, as you pointed out, that um, are uh, the, the most under the income uh, adequacy uh, level. And, and unfortunately, that's why we see that uh, scale of need um, in the Bronx in particular. Uh, you know, what, one of the things um, that occurs to me when we do these kinds of programs is that numbers are, you know, uh, you know, interesting to look at. They're disturbing. Certainly in this case, they're disturbing. But there is a human problem. Um, Definitely. Just we'll ask you and then we're going to go to Ms. Allen, who works face to face with people who are hungry. Um, just talk to me and, and extend a little bit beyond what the, the assembly member said as to who these people are. She talked about working people still not having enough to eat. Um, that's what your report showed as well? Yeah, actually, um, in our report, uh, over 80 percent of the New Yorkers that fall below the self-sufficiency standard or don't have in enough income to live in our city have at least one working adult in the household. Uh, so that tells us that folks are working, and um, unfortunately, the cost of food, housing, and all these other expenses is simply too high. And then if you add in the element of uh, supply chain issues and uh, meat prices being um, nearly 20% higher uh, right now than it was this time last year, uh, we know that a lot of families that we serve are making more pantry visits. Uh, one of the things um, that uh, turned my head around in a way, because of course we've heard from people like Assemblymember Jackson and others about the uh, difficulty of um, the food insecurity in the Bronx, was the friendly fridge I just happened upon on 242nd Street and Broadway. And uh, that brings us to you, uh, Ms. Allen. Talk to me about the friendly fridge. What is it? You know, what is it all about and how does it work and how do we use that to help people get food? So thank you for that question. Uh, the Friendly Fridge is actually a community fridge that my wife and I started back in May of 2020 during the um, heightened that was born out of the pandemic. Um, over a year and a half later, the community fridge is continuing to grow. And what it is, it's a place for people to bring food and for people to come and get food. No question that. Um, the community fridge did not require any information from folks visiting. We don't ask questions. We don't collect personal information. Visitors can remain as anonymous as they wish. And this creates psychological safety. And it also is open 24-7. Anyone can come at any time. Uh, wh wh where do you get the food from? I know the answer to that question, but I think it's important for you to talk about it um, because, you know, people watching it and say, well, wait a minute, we, we can't have this, which is how I feel. Um, wh wh how can they help and where do you get that food from? So, as we know, we live in a country that has about approximately 35 percent food waste, where the uh, food insecurity is about one in five Americans. And those two numbers exist together. I don't know how that's possible. But what we, uh, because we operate in a more agile fashion, we found that the fridge excels at um, redirecting food that would otherwise go to waste. And so that being said, we move about five to seven pounds, or 7,000 pounds of food per week. And the largest quantity we received in one day was uh, seven pallets and it was gone within four, uh, four hours. We work with local farms. We work with farm co-ops such as FX Farm, Dandelion Shed. We work with um, Farmers Market. We also work with schools such as Riverdale Country, Ella Baker, SAR, to name a few. We also work with several pantries like Rapper Bronx, St. Stephen's, Morathania, and Gotham Food Pantries. And they all redirect food to us so that we can get that into the community's hands directly. We have many individuals, families, and, group, and groups that bring home cooked meals, sandwiches, and snacks. And all that we ask is that they're labeled and dated so people know what they're picking up. We receive a steady supply of food from our Gorilla, uh, which is a food delivery service, as well as all washers bakery. And we even received a few calls from our Trader Joe's when they had extra food and City Harvest was not able to pick it up. And we would love for that to happen more often because we're able to move that food very quickly. Well, we, we are going to reach out to uh, Mr. Nathaniel uh, directly and ask him about that. But before we do, I just want to ask you, is there a certain type of food 
you know, or you say, gee, we have a shortage of this. Because, you know, sometimes you go by there and I see a lot of, you know, home cooked meals, about uh, store prepared meals and all different kinds of foods. Is there something or some things in particular or types of foods that you need to keep uh, plentiful at the uh, friendly fridges? Yes, I am so glad you asked that question. We 100% prioritize produce. When we think of people who need food, we're not looking for sodium-loaded food. We want healthy food. Um, we need produce. But the more produce we can get, the better. So, I, I mean, I'm, I'm just going to tell you what I've done. I mean, if I go and I buy a bag of apples in the store, I'll maybe take a half a dozen of them and zip over to the friendly fridge before I go home and say, hey, here's a donation. Um, do you have enough, um, uh, Ms. Allen, do you have enough food uh, uh, to, to serve all the people who stop by? It, it was amazing to me what I learned. People come right off the subway working and they go right to the friendly fridge before they go home. I have to tell you, it broke my heart. Saddest thing you could imagine. Working people need that in order to, to feed their families. Very difficult. So as um, an assemblywoman uh, pointed out earlier, we are seeing on average about 200 to 250 people per day. And that number increases towards the end of the month as people try to pay their mortgage and their rent and their bills. And we are seeing everyone at our refrigerator. We wow. see working people who don't have jobs, people who have part-time jobs, people who have several part-time jobs. We see moms, dads, grandparents, teenagers, students from nearby universities. We even see teenagers coming from uh, school to stop by and pick up food to take home to their parents. We see CNAs, teachers, home aides, construction workers, park employees, cab drivers, everyone. Uh, Mr. Nathaniel, it seems um, pretty uh, logical um, from what she said. She'd love City Harvest or maybe other groups to come by and, and uh, help them out. Is this a difficult thing given tight budgets? Talk to me about the kinds of things from a um, you know, production standpoint that City Harvest does and can do to assist uh, Ms. Allen and others in that effort. You know, if we can put you together, we'll have done a really good thing. Uh, yeah, so City Harvest has a network of 400 different pantry soup kitchens and shelters across the five boroughs. Uh, we have um, over 60 that are based in the Bronx, and between uh, July 2021 and um, uh, this month, we have delivered um, nearly 10 million pounds of food uh, through our pantries in the Bronx. Um, so this year, we're actually on pace to do about 300,000 pounds, pounds a day, with the overwhelming majority of it being produce. Um, and, you know, much appreciation for the state for also helping us with programs like uh, a program called Norris New York that allows us to source um, state produce as well. Uh, uh, ha having said that, even with our operation being at that scale, we know that there's always a, a greater need than um, we or charities able to meet on its own. So we're um, always happy to see um, organizations, uh, different fridges that are able to also uh, step in. Uh, where we don't necessarily may not have the capacity to to make it to Trader Joe for a donation or or get there and and get it to a pantry. So I, I think it's an all hands on deck uh, community effort for sure. Uh, one of the things that has come up in this dialogue, and we'll go back to Assembly Member Jackson, is the uh, relationship between farms and creating fresh fruit and bringing produce to the Bronx. Um, Assembly Member. Is there an understanding um, or a communication? You know, there's always this talk about upstate and downstate. Is there a communication um, between the farms upstate and uh, us here in the Bronx that can help fuel with food uh, this effort and, of course, help build the economies uh, upstate? Nobody would, would mind that either. So is there communication? Yes. Could there be more communication? 100%. Uh, we are doing our best to get people uh, or get farmers to have their produce here locally. So, so we're just trying to figure out how to make that work. It is happening right now. A lot of our apples come from farms that are close to us. But we want to see way more uh, produce here in the Bronx that is locally grown. Um, and I think it's also important that we as city people, you know, make our ways to the farm and see how close they are to us. Some of them are really close. Uh, do your colleagues in the assembly, um, let, who you know you may not have other things in common with, understand that there is common ground here that 
if the farmers work with the, you know, the farmers markets or even um, the stores in the Bronx, do they understand well enough or is it still a struggle to get upstate and downstate to talk about uh, what really is a common issue? No, it seems like, uh, especially now that I'm here and a lot of the newly electeds are here, uh, it seems like there's lots of conversation and understanding and people are more than willing to work together. Every year there's a farm tour that the state assembly goes on and we visit different farms upstate. It happens during the summer. Uh, and that's how, you know, city folks normally get to experience what it's like to be a farmer and the things that, that are possible for our district. So there's lots of conversations and um, things are happening. Ms. Allen, you... Um uh, you know, you, you talked. We talked about the one on 242nd Street, but now I know there's one in in Mott Haven. Uh, there's one up, uh, um, let's say, at the River, Riverdale neighborhood house. There were more of them in the Bronx, more of these fridges, but they disappeared. I remember once we came went over to one on 231st Street near near the church up there, and uh, it was gone. We did end up going to 242nd Street, but why why don't we? Could we have more around uh, the borough of the Bronx where the need is so great? Yeah, so that's a great question. So the reason why we're successful and we're able to maintain this is because we have a full-time fridge manager, Lily, who is bilingual. She's able to talk to the community. She's able to coordinate drop-off. She's able to really coordinate all of the details that go into bringing in food. And that full-time maintenance is a, it's really a requirement in making sure that we meet safety standards, et cetera, et cetera. So, we also have a fantastic fleet of volunteers. We can always need use more. We can always need more with additional support. You know, going back to your question about um, going upstate for farms, one of our largest challenges is logistics, getting food from point A to point B. So many folks want to help, but how do we get the food from point A to point B? We get phone calls all the time asking, we have food for you, but how do we get it here? That's our number one challenge. Uh, which and, it takes, and it takes uh, time. This brings us back to you at City Harvest, and it's really a similar question that I asked the assembly member. Is it a matter of funding? I mean, if you had more money, you could have more trucks and go out there. Is it a matter of saying, you know, let's get more money? Or is it an infrastructure thing? Say, hey, we got to figure out how to do this better. And that's, that's uh, for you, uh, Mr. Nathaniel. I would say it's a both end. Um, I kind of briefly alluded to a program called Nourish New York that allows us to source food from farmers upstate and actually compensate those farmers. So that program went a long way during the pandemic. But then there's also the infrastructure. Uh, City Harvest has um, well over two dozen trucks, two wow. tractor trailers, and uh, we just moved into a 150,000 square foot warehouse. Um, so it, it's a large operation and, and even still, uh, we have the challenge of things like um, nas nationwide, there's driver shortages, for instance. So I think it's a very complex issue from the supply chain and also funding for the food itself. You know, when you talk about the size of your operation and you mentioned you have 2,000 trucks, you'd say, well, OK, we're handling it. But it, it, well, it's two dozen. Sorry. <laughs> two thousand what? Two, two dozen over two dozen. Yeah. Uh, over 24, yeah. Yeah, well, I'm, whatever the number is, it still sounds like a lot, and yet we're still not getting there. It's, it's an incredibly frustrating. Um, what about, um, I, I mentioned this earlier, um, Assembly Member, um, what about, um, um, you know, um, tax breaks for groceries? In other words, we, we get tax breaks for developers, we get tax breaks for all kinds of things, but, you know, I'm thinking um, in, in my neighborhood, uh, we'll talk about uh, in my neighborhood, uh, we have Garden Gourmet, which is a locally owned, um, you know, grocery store. They they do fresh food and, and it's a wonderful place. If they could do better, if they could expand, if they could provide more stuff, have more employees, we could do better. Is that something I'm asking <laughs> that you could put on the table when you get up to Albany and say, you know what, let's look at our grocers and let's see if we could really help them. You, I am with you 100%. <laughs> um, I, I trust that you, we all are in agreement with this. Uh, we should incentivize the growing and selling of healthy food. Uh, it's sad that I can get like three things off the dollar menu um, and have a meal <laughs> versus paying $10 for a salad. And so I'm with you 100%, and I would love to see people grow more in their homes. 
Uh, that's all. It's all part of that same conceptual uh, idea. Thank you so much for joining us uh, this evening. Uh, Mr. Nathaniel, um, final comments for you. What, what do you say to the people of the Bronx, number one, who are hungry, and number two, who might have a little extra that can assist? And, uh, you know, g let's get your final words there. Yeah, I would say, you know, we're all New Yorkers and we're New Yorkers helping New Yorkers. Um, so I, I look at we're all in this together. For folks that are need to find food, I encourage them to visit our website, cityharvest.org. You type in your address and you can find any pantry that's um, within your area or zip code and the hours and the day that they uh, distribute food as well. And then equally for people that want to give back, you can also use that resource to volunteer or also find ways to donate to City Harvest and our partners as well. And the final uh, word uh, for you, Ms. Allen, you look at people face to face. Uh, the bottom line is give to the friendly fridge, visit the friendly fridge. I mean, you got it. We've got about 30 seconds. What do you got? I would love to see more grocery stores and delis become incentivized, incentivized mm. to actually redirect food to the friendly fridge. There are, there's a lot of hesitation between, um, between the uh, organizations because they feel that they might be on the line for um, law, lawsuits, but that's not true because there's the Bill Emerson Act that actually protects people and protects organizations as long as you donate and you're not Got involved. it. We're, so we're, I would, we, we got to run. Thank you so much, uh, Assemblymember Chantel Jackson, uh, Jerome Nathaniel from City Harvest, and Sarah Allen from uh, the Friendly Fridge BX. We completely appreciate uh, everything that everybody's doing, and let's all work together and get people food, plain and simple. So that'll do it for us. Uh, we thank our producers, Stephen Powell and uh, Rebecca Hemick. Our director is uh, Benaya War. And guess what? We're going to be here next week with more. Uh, Congress Member uh, Richie Torres will join us next week. Good night.